Good morning. Welcome to the Zoom Nation, as I call us. Church on Zoom, as it, as it reaches out to not only the parts of the U.S., but many parts of the world. I want to thank David for the opportunity to teach over the next two weeks. I'm really excited about the things that the Father's showing me. Uh, last time I talked with David, we were going to, I was going to discuss Romans 11, verses 11 through 32, and the grafting of the Gentiles to the roots of Israel as a conclusion to the great lie adopted by God. But while compiling my notes, I was strongly redirected by the Holy Spirit to put that subject aside and explore what I've titled The Wisdom of God. My study began one night when I was looking at the Hebrew words for time in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The study of those three words led me to Proverbs chapter 8. Now, Proverbs to me, while an interesting book, has really never been anything to me more than an instruction manual for knowledge and wisdom. And chapter 8 was just another brick in the wall of that same tedious lecturing of Solomon. But on that night, and at that moment, the identity of wisdom, beginning with the Godhead, <clears throat> before the creation of time, began to unfold like a documentary. I was in amazement. I was amazement at what I was seeing. Proverbs chapter 8 became a mural that was painted by the wisdom of God. Our union with the Father through spiritual new birth, the cross, redemption, reconciliation, and spiritual identity before the foundation of the world unfolded as I continued to read and to look at the words in the Hebrew and the Septuagint, the Greek, Hebrew to Greek Bible. Reading with the mind of the spiritual son, at that moment, the depth of God began to speak to the depth of my spirit. But in the interest of time, I must teach what I've come to understand about the wisdom of God over two weeks. I will lay a foundation and there will be a considerable amount of what David said last week today. But I will lay a foundation this week and discuss Proverbs chapter 8 next. And that is a fascinating chapter. It would be an injustice to the revelation of wisdom to do otherwise. So let me begin teaching today by starting with John 1, 1 through 4, and reading it from an entirely different understanding. In the beginning was the wisdom, and the wisdom was with God, and the wisdom was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Now you'll find verse 4 next week. Proverbs 8, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The wisdom became flesh and made his dwelling among us, among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Wisdom is a lot like the words we've taught on the past, love and spiritual birth. We use these words but their true meaning is not understood. I could ask a hundred different people, a hundred different believers, to define wisdom, and I would get a hundred different understandings. As David has taught in the past, in psychology, that is called the illusion of explanatory depth. It means that you think you fully understand something that you do not. I say this, because I'm going to give wisdom and identity over the next two weeks that most in the church 
have never realized. It is common to hear a pastor or a Christian teacher or minister tell you that you need to get wisdom by reading the Word of God or listening to a wise teacher. A famous name at claimant, and I won't mention his name, ministry writes this, quote, as a Christian, you have a mighty resource at your disposal, the wisdom of God. Not only can the wisdom of God help you make good decisions in your life, but God's word promises that it brings joy, long life, riches, and honor. Continuing the quote, no matter what your problem, the wisdom of God found in his word, the Bible, is the place to start. Now, almost every one of us have heard this or have believed this or still do believe this today. It is a common understanding of the wisdom of God. Most believers today see wisdom as knowledge and self-discipline necessary to make good decisions. It's God's magic eight ball or a formula that gives you that he gives you in times of your difficult decisions. Wisdom has become a high idea that we can really never achieve. In life, wisdom always seems to overpromise and underliver. After all, how many of us listening today have riches and glory and honor? And that begs the question, do we really know the wisdom of God? Let me get some water. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 29, I'm going to read, For the word of the cross is foolishness, to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Notice, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the understanding of those who have understanding, I will confound. Where is the wise person? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world. <clears throat> For, since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than mankind, and the weakness of God is stronger than mankind. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the insignificant things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no human may boast before God. Now, I'm going to save 30, verse 30, for a little later. But we read wise and wisdom ten times in that passage. And we also see, well, let me first ask you this. Your belief, people believe, that wisdom is just wisdom. And all wisdom is the same. When some, yes, somebody to, 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 to define wisdom, they don't say which one. But that's naive, because 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul tells us 
that there are two different wisdoms. The first wisdom is the wisdom of the world. This is a temporal wisdom that is present only within the third dimensional boundaries of linear time. It is wisdom that began in the Garden of Eden and will be destroyed when time ends. God said, I will bring that wisdom to destruction. This wisdom belongs to the dominion of man. So the wisdom of man is literally temporal. It's temporary. It's of this world, and it is time-dependent because it began and will end within the boundaries of time. This wisdom, because this is the wisdom of man, this wisdom is intellectual, philosophical, and scientific. It is wisdom that is based on our five senses and the perceived created world around us. Merriam-Webster defines wisdom as the following, the ability to discern inner qualities and relationships, insight, good sense, judgment, generally accepted belief, and D, accumulated philosophical or scientific learning, knowledge. Every one of those is of our senses. Good sense. That's sense dependent. Philosophical and scientific learning. <clears throat> this wisdom is relative and subject to a person's perspective. S what you may think is wise is to another person foolish. There's no standard. It is based on a person's perspective. In fact, that is confirmed in Proverbs 14, 12, where it reads, there is a way, there is a wisdom that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 14, 12 pretty well sums up the wisdom of man. The second wisdom is the wisdom of God. God's wisdom is eternal and was present before time and creation. We will see this next week when we look at Proverbs 8. It exists outside of the boundaries of time. It exists outside of the existence of man. It's fourth dimensional and cannot be discerned or defined by intellect, philosophy, or science. For this very reason, this wisdom is foolishness to the world, lacking the foundation of man's intellect. If they can't see it, if they can't taste it, hear it, feel it, or smell it, it's foolishness. The wisdom of the world is based on the foundation of man's intellect. The wisdom of God is not. And because of that, the wisdom of God is foolishness to man. Spiritual wisdom is not as that quoted ministry, as I quoted that ministry earlier. It is not a resource of God. Wisdom is not a resource of God that is at your disposal by reading the Bible. It is not a formula of behavior that promises the riches and honor of this world. God's wisdom is a person. The wisdom is Christ. As I started this teaching, in the beginning was the wisdom. And the wisdom was with God. And the wisdom was God. And this wisdom became flesh. The word is wisdom. We will see that in the next three verses. Let me get some water. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1:22 through 25. For indeed, we've read this before, just a few minutes ago. Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. And here's what I want to highlight. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ 
the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. Paul identifies the wisdom of God right there. And if you want to read it again, in 1 Corinthians 1.30, which we did not read a minute ago, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, whom of God is made unto us my, our wisdom, who has made unto me. That's very personal. God has made unto me wisdom to us and righteousness and sanctification. And that word, redemption. Wisdom and redemption we'll see next week. This is Proverbs 8. 1 Corinthians 2, 6-8. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age. That is very important. We speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, of this time. We're going to speak wisdom to you, but it is outside the boundaries of time. It is not of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. It is hidden, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before time, before the ages for our glory. A hidden wisdom which God ordained before time, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Wisdom is somebody. Wisdom is a person. There's one thing I'm going to ask you to do as we continue. <clears throat> this is very hard. I want you to try to think. I want you to see in your mind's eye before linear time began, before creation. Before time had ever been created, I want you to go there, and this is very hard because, as John writes, in the beginning, John, John was able to go to the beginning, but Ecclesiastes says to us that from the beginning, from creation, there is an appointed time for everything. And there's a time for every matter under heaven. So we're bound in linear thinking. And I'm going to ask while I read the next few verses that you can put that aside and in your mind's eye see the Godhead before there was ever a world and ever time. In your mind's eye, before there was a heaven, before there was a sun and earth, or moon, before the creation of the angels in heaven, before the creation of time or the foundation of this world. Keep that image in mind as I read the following verses. 1 Peter 1, 17-21. If you address the Father as the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay. That word stay means your visit, your sojourn, your temporary stay on earth. We really don't think of it that way, do we? A visit or a temporary stay on earth. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. And this is where I wanted to highlight. But with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world and has appeared, made visible, made clear, and put in open view in these last times for the sake of you. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world the blood of Christ was shed before the foundation of the world. 
Ephesians 1, 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us, chose you in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. So we've seen two things here that have happened before time and, as Paul says, before the foundation of the world. The cross and you were chose to be in him. You chose, he, would, he chose us, he chose you in him before the foundation of the world. Both of those are direct references to before time, as John says, in the beginning. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ compels us. This is something David will say 10 times, 100 times to my one, but I will say it today. For the love of Christ compels us. Having concluded this, that one has died, therefore all have died. All is the masculine and feminine of every one, anyone. David will say, who does that leave out? Obviously, the Greek leaves out no one. Masculine and feminine, every one. So, those three verses tell you that before time and before the foundation of the world, you were in Christ on the cross at his death. And when he died, all men, all women, everyone and anyone died. Those verses, those three verses are telling us something that most believers today do not understand. Redemption, reconciliation, the forgiveness of sin, and our victory over death, simply the cross and the resurrection happened before time and creation. You were in Christ on the cross and sin was forgiven before Calgary or Golgotha had ever been created. The power of sin, which is death, was destroyed before there was a man created to nail Christ to the cross. Before there was a B.C. or an A.D., before there was a land or a forest to cut the wood for the cross, before the heavens, before there were heavens to darken at his death, blood of Christ was poured out for you. And we'll see that in Proverbs 8 again. All this is setting up Proverbs 8. And I'm laying a foundation for what we're about to look into next week. As Peter wrote, these things were manifested in linear time for your sake. If they had not been manifested in time, we wouldn't be here talking about them. And there's a reason that the Father did this before time that we're going to get into. But again, keep that thought in mind. When was sin forgiven? Ask yourself that. When were you chosen in Christ, becoming holy and blameless before God? Why do you believe that the cross was God's way of fixing what Satan and man had messed up in the garden? Because that's what we believe. It was, it, was a, it was a fix it. It was a patch to put on Adam's sin. Why does the church make salvation today an issue of sin and behavior? And why do we constantly live under the guilt and shame of failure? Those are questions you have to ask because those are directly the questions that this teaching addresses. The simple answer is because we do not understand spiritual birth. Let me speak clearly. I am not saying that sin does not exist or that sin is not in the world. No, I'm not. Sin does exist and is present because sin is a person and that person is Satan. 
What I'm saying is that you were crucified with Christ and you were in Christ on that cross before the creation of the world. Because of that death, of that death, you were declared righteous, innocent, and acquitted of the penalty for sin. Can you still make a decision to sin? Yes. Every individual has the right to make that decision. But as David taught last week, you were reconciled to God before the first man was ever created. And yes, even before Satan was created. Water break again. So if you're having problems with this, let me ask you, when did Jesus say that you cannot see or enter the kingdom of God unless your sins are forgiven you? And when did he say that many will cry, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, your sins were not forgiven. Depart from me. That may be the way you hear those verses and the way that you think when you read those verses. But that is not what Jesus said. I want to look literally at those verses. In John 3, 3 through 7, Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, except anyone be born from above, he is not able to see the kingdom of God. Okay, there's no sin mentioned there. Nicodemus says to him, How is a man able to be born being old? Is he able to enter the womb of his mother a second time or to be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless anyone be born of water and of the Spirit, he is not able to enter into the kingdom of God. That having been born of the flesh is flesh, and that having been born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not wonder that I say to you, it is necessary for you all to be born from above. There was no mention of sin there. And what a perfect opportunity to talk about it if it was relevant. He's telling us what it takes to see and enter the kingdom of God. You thought, I, I, you'd have thought he'd have mentioned that. Let's look again at the other thing that we think. In Matthew 7, 22 well, it says 22 through 21. It's actually 22 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And I actually would reword that to say, not everyone who cries to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't think there will be quite a passive discussion. But the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. I will declare to them, I never knew you. What a great opportunity to say, I will declare to them, your sins were not forgiven. Leave me. But he did not. He said, I never knew you. So that, make, that draws us to the attention of what does this know, what does this new mean? It means in the Greek the word genusko. And that word is very important because we, believe it or not, will see it next week in the interlinear Greek to English Septuagint of the Old Testament. We will see when the, when the Hebrew was translated to Greek 300 years before Christ, we will see that word in the Greek, no. So let's revisit that word genosko in the Strong's Greek lexicon now. Genosko. Properly to know, especially through personal experience, first-hand acquaintance, experientially know, is used, for example, and this is very important, in Luke 134, 
And Mary, a virgin, said to the angel, How will this be, since I do not know? In the Greek, genosko also means sexual intimacy, a man. It means union with a man. Because of that, we refer to know, and people in the fellowship as we discussed it and taught it, know as a union with, an intimate personal experience. Once again, you may read and think sin keeps us from the kingdom of God, but that is not what Christ said. An individual will be kept from entering the kingdom of God because they are not in intimate union with him through the spiritual new birth. Like the natural conception of a child through the union of male sperm and the female ovum, the spiritual new birth is the union of our spirit and Christ's spirit. That union becomes oneness. And that oneness makes us the spiritual son of God with the exact identity of God the Father. As Paul writes, we become an entirely new and different species that have never been seen before. And just a side note, going to church, growing up in a Christian family, or living a perfect and sinless life is not the same as receiving Christ and becoming a spiritual son of God. God does not politely know you. Let me rephrase that. God does not want to have a relationship with you. He wants you to be related to him through a spiritual birth. You are either spiritually born from above or you are not. Spiritual birth is the only issue. The issue is not sin. Sin was handled before time. Let's move on and look at 1 John 2, 13 through 14. I'm going to read 1 John 2, 13 through 14. I have written to you, children, because you know, Genosco, the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know, Genosco, him, who has been from the beginning. What is the difference between a child and a father? On the surface, nothing, because both already know Genosco and are in union with the Father. John made that clear. Children know the Father, and a spiritual father knows his heavenly Father. But a spiritual child only knows the Father in this present time, in linear time. Whereas a spiritual father knows God the Father from the beginning, before time. That is the difference between a spiritual child and a spiritual father. What point of reference do they know God from? A child knows him now, but a spiritual father knows him before the foundations of the earth were laid. In John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning, that means what came first, that was first, was the Word, the wisdom of God. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him, not even one thing came into being. In that sequence, the beginning was before creation and before time. That was a sequence. In the beginning, what came first, a spiritual father knows God before time was ever created. 
You will never be able, now this is important, listen closely, you will never be able to walk away from religion if you do not know the Father from the beginning, from before time, and before the foundation of the earth was laid. And you ask me why? Because religion can only survive within the boundaries of time. Religion was born in time and can only exist within this temporal world, within this three-dimensional creation. Religion is not spiritual. It is of the flesh. It was born in the Garden of Eden and it will be destroyed with the earth. Religion is a dead man walking and it does not have the power to give life to save you. Now listen to this. Nothing within this created dimension does. That is why God reconciled man outside of the boundaries of time. Nothing of God can be temporal. But they have been made and will be they will be revealed and made clear to us in linear time that we may see them. But nothing that God can be temporal. It can't be within the boundaries of time because that would make them temporal. They're demonstrated and manifested to us in time. But they were before creation. If you cannot understand this, then you will always be as 1 John 2.12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. If you can't see the Father, if you can't see the Son before time, it will always be about your sins being daily forgiven. And you will constantly live in your past and your fear of failure. You will not live in the freedom of sonship or the understanding of the mystery of God. Because the mystery of God is the hidden wisdom which God predestined to our glory and it must be found before the foundation of the world from the beginning. If you cannot go back and understand that it is not about sin, you will live a defeated Christian life. You will live in your past. You will live in your failure. You will live in the do's and don'ts. You will live in legalism. To understand that it is about oneness with the Father through Christ and that you are a spiritual son. Jesus said, and you will know the Son and it will set you free. That revelation will set you free. In conclusion, today, I want to take this closing time to give you what the church would call my testimony. Many of you heard this testimony before, but I, I believe it is appropriate to share it again. Before I read this, let me get some water. I had existed as a Christian in a very dry spiritual desert that I consider religion for 40 years. Baptist churches, Assembly of God, independent churches, Bible churches. I always thought the Bible churches would be more spiritual because I didn't give them a name. But it was a desert. As I look back over the years, as many, of, as many, as I, I know many of you have asked, as I look back over the years, I knew there was more to being a Christian, as I saw it, than the constant struggle to be like Christ through lifeless legalism and right and wrongs. Many of you 
I've asked that same question. Spiritual truth was like a thousand-piece puzzle, and no one had given me the picture on the box. I don't know if you've ever built a puzzle without the picture, but if the colors are similar, it's almost impossible. I had random truths, but I had no clue of the picture they were to form. I had no clue of its intent. I had no clue of its purpose. I had no clue of the plan. I didn't know what the picture was to be. I had random truths, but no clue of what I was making, the picture they were to form. Every belief I held led me down a road of a thousand more questions. The rapture, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Can you, are gifts real? The resurrection. Every truth, every belief I held led me down a road of a thousand questions. In hindsight, I didn't know much. But I knew there was more. I clearly remember at 17 years old in a very small central Texas town called Leander, I drove to Austin and pulled my pickup over in a crowded Kmart parking lot. And I told my Heavenly Father, I only have one request, and that is to know wisdom. At 17 years old, I prayed that. I prayed that. I said, if there's nothing else you do, I want to know wisdom. 47 years later, since that 17-year boy prayed that, seven, 47 years later, and one very, very long, dry desert, I now see the Father cherished and honored that request. He would reveal to me his mystery, his hidden wisdom that he had destined for my glory before time began. I don't know why, when I look at David and other individuals, why I was so late to the party. But I have come to see that my youthful stubbornness and persistent self-reliance had to be shattered like a clay vase before I could receive a revelation that was beyond me, that was beyond my beliefs, that was beyond my understanding. If it didn't fall within my bias, I wouldn't receive it. It took 47 years for the Father to break through that vase. At the age of 52, my life would come apart unlike anything that I have ever known or will ever know again. Over the next five years, from age 52, I would experience divorce, family death, unemployment, bankruptcy, and at 59 years old, to put the icing on the cake, the diagnosis of my own genetically inherited fatal lung disease. It was the very same disease that had claimed my mother that I took care of a few years earlier. And it was the same disease that was rapidly disabling my brother. At that moment, after all of those things, I was devastated. My foundation was quickly being rocked. It had been rocked, and my identity had come apart. My questions to the Father turned from the profound questions that I used to ask to simply, why God? Why? Emptied of every significant identity that I had ever built, I was only then at the beginning of a new reality. From that point forward, the Father would orchestrate people and events that would introduce me to the revelation of His Son. Men were placed in my life that would introduce me to the Father's purpose 
and a tent of the new birth and my spiritual oneness and identity as a spiritual son of God. Warren Lintzman and David Kennebrew. I now saw that a true spiritual son could not be made with convincing arguments or lifestyle changes. This son had to be birthed from above. I had spent my entire life trying to make myself a spiritual son of God. But I had done everything so right. But if I had, if I had done everything by the book, why had I failed so miserably? Because I had the instruction manual right in front of me the whole time. Marriage, business, wisdom, I had it all in front of me. And in 57, it had all come apart. And I asked, how could I have failed so miserably? My life's frustration lay not at the feet of others that I wanted to blame, but my own. Wisdom and righteousness could not and would not be found in what I'd learned, but rather in the spiritual son that I had become. I now have the picture on that puzzle box. And I see on that picture that my identity as a spiritual son of God would become a single answer to my thousand questions. My father was truly faithful to that 17-year-old boy's request to know wisdom. I had sought conformity. He gave me transformation. I had sought a life of change, but he gave me an exchanged life. He exchanged my pain for his peace, my fears for his love, and my despair for joy, my guilt for freedom, and death for life. Christ did not change my life, but through death, he exchanged my life and my identity for oneness with his. I can now say with Paul, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. This life I now understand to live, I live as the spiritual son to my father God. But you know, many of you, I'm no different. I'm no different than you. Many of you are walking that same question. There's got to be more. I understand everything I've been told from the pulpit, but there's got to be more. For the, excuse me, for those who have never even asked that question, it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done because it's not about sin. It's about union with him through spiritual birth. God wants to conform you to the image of his son. He desires to spiritually birth you to a new identity, to a new reality, to another person, to a new species. We are told in John 1, if it was about sin, why would John have written this? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But as many as receive him are in union with him and are spiritually birthed. This spiritual new birth is profoundly simple. You must receive him for that, for with that that's within your right to decide. It is within your decision which you have the power and authority to make. And within that right to decide lies the power to become the spiritual son of God to your father. If you'd already received Christ, then the father wants to reveal to you your true identity as he did me. He wants to renew your mind to the process of sonship. We've heard this and it's true. Ask 
and life will be given to you. Seek him and you will find the answers to your thousand questions. Knock and an understanding of eternity will be open to you. Knock and eternity itself will be open to you. I conclude with this. Live as the Son of God because that is exactly who you are. Amen.